Once again, we want to thank you for tuning in to Crossings, a ministry of Calvary Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Dwight Lapine, and I'll be your host this morning as we get started in teaching you what the Bible says, not only about eternal life, but how to get to know God daily, moment by moment, in a personal way. We trust that this connection would really help you have a peace and a joy as you come to know Him and believe in Him. There's so many people that live without hope today. And of course, many live in the shadow of the death of Christ. And they go to church each week to celebrate His death. And the death becomes very important to them because their sin is not remitted unless they are able to partake of that death. And of course, there is a little hope there because if they do die without having partaken of the death, then they will have to pay for their own sin. But the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so different than that because when He rose from the dead, God put a stamp of approval upon that resurrection saying that I have accepted your death, his death on the cross, as payment for all sin. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sin only, but also for the sin of the whole world. God designed us to have hope, and of course to live in a world without hope is so contrary to what God has for us. My wife was sharing with me this, this past week that one of Satan's main desires was to destroy the seed of David. She was listening to a, a, a sermon and just sharing what she had heard on that sermon. I thought, wow, that's important. Satan was trying throughout all of the Old Testament to wipe out the seed of David. And he almost succeeded a couple times with Athaliah, uh, Athaliah which was one of the, the mothers of a king, she had all of the royal seed killed except one man by the name of Joash who was able to be hidden from her and was not killed and the seed of David was preserved. During the time of Herod, of course, he had every baby killed in, in uh, Bethlehem because he wanted to kill the seed of David who would be the rightful heir. Many times, Satan had his, his attempts to kill that seed of David and he succeeded on the cross. You understand when Jesus died upon the cross because in 70 AD Titus came and destroyed the, the, the temple, all of the records were destroyed. There is no record of anyone else who could sit upon the throne of David. When Jesus died, all of the royal seed of David died. There is no longer anyone who is able to sit upon the throne of David. No one could prove their genealogy, but the resurrection, Satan's attempt to destroy the seed were in vain because the resurrection has kept one man alive who can prove that he's a descendant of David. And he can sit upon the throne of David and he can never, ever die again. And so that seed has been preserved when the women came, and I'm sorry that this is difficult to read here today. Of course, it's a whole lot easier to read when you put it together on the computer, but it's a little dark. I think our bulb is getting a little dull on this computer, so it's a little harder to read today. But very early in the morning, those women came to the grave, and all of their hope was dashed. They had very little hope in Jesus being the Messiah, because if he was the Messiah, obviously this would not have happened. He would not have died upon the cross. They were not coming to the, th to the grave to find a resurrection. They were coming to the grave to anoint the body of one who had been dead. And again, the hope is gone so, for so many people in this world. And I really believe that for the majority of Christians that come to church every week, they understand the death of Christ a whole lot more than they understand the resurrection. I think very few Christians really understand the impact of the resurrection on their own life. What it means that Jesus Christ is alive today. That the tomb is empty. We need to go back and just examine what that means for the church. What that means for me. That Jesus is not in the tomb. That he's not in the grave. Why, the reason why the women came very early that morning is because... 
Jesus had been dead for three days and three nights, and by this time his body would smell. They didn't want to assault the senses of the people walking by that area with a dead body. They really did believe that he would be dead. And again, friends, I want you to know this, again, that the majority of Christianity celebrates Jesus' death on Friday. And I'll be, the, be, be um, real strong on this point. The reason they celebrate the death of Christ on Friday is they do not understand the Scriptures. They have not really studied it. It's all based on tradition. And majority of pastors in the state of Minnesota are going to be celebrating, will have celebrated Good Friday services. We were at a pastor's meeting this past week and every pastor was having a Good Friday service. Jesus did not die on Friday. You can remember that Matthew 12, 40, as Jonas was three days and three nights, thanks Troy, <laughs> I appreciate that, in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And people say, well, yes, pastor, but a part of a day is a whole day. If you are partial, yeah, that may be, make sense and it's a great study, but the truth is three days and three nights, you do not find three nights from Friday night to Saturday night. It's not possible. Therefore, this scripture, in order for it to be fulfilled, Jesus did not die on Friday. Now, honestly, folks, the thing that makes it important and Troy, we'll have to get back off it because I, my, my, I can't click on it right now. But um, honestly, the problem with it is in, in John 19, 14, it was the preparation of the Passover. And again, I want you to take your Bible and turn to it. I don't want you just to look on your board because these are important matters. I won't be on this subject very long this morning, probably five minutes and I'll be off it. But I want you to look again at at John chapter 19, because there's two passages I want you to look at here in this, in this verse, just because so much of what we deal with in Christianity has to do with tradition. John chapter 19, when you look at verse 14, it was the preparation of the Passover. The Passover had not occurred yet. When he was in for the trial, it was the preparation of the Passover. You do not prepare for something that had already transpired. This is after the Lord's Supper that we call His Last Supper. This is not the Passover. It's still the preparation of the Passover. Jesus' death was when the Lamb was crucified. The Lamb was always crucified. I'm sorry, the Lamb was always killed or sacrificed the day before Passover on the preparation day. It is still the Passover. Now, the reason why we have a problem is this. Again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. But the reason we have a problem is Jesus, of course, the body has to be taken off the cross for the Sabbath day. The Sabbath is Saturday, therefore he must have died on Friday. What they don't realize is there were three Sabbaths that week. Clearly, three Sabbaths. Passover was a Sabbath. What that means is, on a Sabbath, you cannot do any work. You must remain in your homes. You must be in worship for God. And that's really clear. Listen to this next verse. Again, we're on the same thing again, Troy. There we go. June, John 19, 31. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day. You can read it in your scriptures, in your Bible. This is not a normal Sabbath. This is not the Saturday the body could not remain on the cross on that Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day. What was the Sabbath? We just looked at it. It was the preparation of the Passover. Again, because it was the pre preparation day, this particular Sabbath was a high Sabbath. And I want you to take real quickly and turn to Leviticus chapter 23, because I want you to see how the, the Sabbaths work together in the time that Jesus died on the upon the cross. In Leviticus chapter 23, again, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, in chapter 23 and verse 4, these are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in their seasons. These are holy days, high days. In the 14th day of the first month at evening is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. In the first day you will have a holy convocation. Listen to this. You will do no servile work on that day. 
You cannot work on that day. It's a Sabbath. It's a day of rest. You cannot work. There were many floating Sabbaths in the Jewish calendar. You can read Leviticus 23 and you can find many of these floating Sabbaths. The seventh month, the first day of the month. Because it's the first day of the month, it's a Sabbath. It floats. It's not always on Saturday. This is not the normal Sabbath. Now listen to this. There are three Sabbaths that week. Matthew 28, verse 1. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. What you don't understand here by reading it in the English is the word Sabbath here is actually plural. That is not a singular word. And again, I can't show it to you clearly in the black, but the word sabbaton has an omega new ending. In this word, this is the Greek word, the sabbaton. And because it is an omega new ending, and again, it doesn't show up here, but it's an accusative, or it's a genitive plural, and the genitive plural with an omega new ending. Again, it doesn't show up at all in this, show, this form. But an omega new ending is a genitive plural in Greek. Therefore, the way the, the verse actually says, the end of the Sabbaths, or the Sabbaths plural, end, the first day begins. There were three Sabbaths that week, and it's clearly borne out in the Scriptures. Now, what's fascinating to me is this. Even though it is extremely clear in the Greek, in Westcott and Hort, or the the Textus Receptus, both of them are very clear on Sabbaton. Every English Bible translates it singular. And you say, wait a second, we're talking about Greek scholars who know what the genitive plural is. Why would they translate that singular? It's because we are very steeped in tradition, and when you read the English Bible, it's always singular, and you say, why? when that's definitely in both, all of the Greek manuscripts, this is a genitive plural. So I don't understand why that happens, but that does happen. Now, having said that, please understand, if Jesus had been in the tomb for all day Friday, all day Saturday, he had been in the tomb all of that time, all day Thursday, all day Friday, all day Saturday, those are three days that he is in the tomb, and all of those nights he's in the tomb, by the time the women are getting up on Sunday morning, they say the body is going to start to smell, and it's going to start to smell bad. We've got to get there as early as possible so we can anoint that body so that it doesn't smell. Now again, the reason I say that is important. Remember again, you're looking at this passage in John eleven thirty two. 32. Take ye away the stone, Martha said, of him that was dead. Lord, by this time he stinks. He's been dead four days already, and by now he stinks. Don't move the tomb, because if you move the stone, you're going to have smell. The body's going to start to bloat by this time. There, it's hot. It's warm. The sun beats down, and we're going to have some real problems. And so we don't want to move that stone yet. And of course, the women came very, very early in the morning so that they would not assault the, ascents, the senses of the people around there. The problem with coming early in the morning is, who's going to move the stone? And of course, they know that there are guards at the tomb. They know that the tomb has been sealed. And we know that because they became as dead men, they didn't leave their posts. The guards were there, and so they would have been possibly were able to have that that one to be able to take, move the stone. When they got to the tomb, the angel said to them, He is not here, for He has risen. I want you to understand, He is not here. That's knowable. You can know that. He's not there. Look at it. He's not here. He has risen from the dead. That's not something that is knowable. They did not understand what that could mean. What does it mean to rise again from the dead? <laughs> In the, in the Bible, people were resuscitated. They come, came back from, to life. They were still there. You could see Him. You could talk to Him. But in Jesus' case, He was gone. What does it mean? He's resurrected. He's risen from the dead. Of course, the women ran to find the disciples, and they came to Him, and they said, Jesus is gone. We saw an angel said He's risen from the dead. They came running back. Peter and John came running back to the tomb, 
John outran Peter. He came and he looked in, but Peter ran right in and there was no body. He saw the grave clothes lying by themselves and they went away and they believed. But Mary stood there. She wasn't going to leave. She stood there. And she sees this man in the garden. She thinks he's a gardener. And she says, if you've, you've taken the body, tell me where you've put it so I could come and, 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 and anoint it. She still doesn't understand the resurrection. It's not something that had ever happened before. When we talk about the resurrection, we're not talking about Jesus coming back in a physical body. This is a spiritual glorified body. This is the first fruits of them that slept. This man will never die again. Lazarus died again. The Syrophoenician woman, their son, died again. But this one would never die again. His body was glorified. It was much different than our bodies. We look at Luke chapter 24. The disciples on the road to Emmaus, they said, why are you so sad? He says, well, <laughs> Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God, and how the chief priests and rulers have delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trust that it had been he which would have redeemed Israel. And their hope is gone. Their hope is shattered. We thought he was going to be the redeemer of Israel and he's gone. And you can see these men there that their hope is gone because Jesus is dead. That wasn't supposed to happen. He was the redeemer. He was the promised one. But Jesus, of course, said this. Certain of the women also of our company made us astonished, which early, came early at the sepulcher. When they found not his body, they came saying they had seen a vision of angels and said that he was alive. And Jesus said, O oh, fool of heart and slow of belief, all, slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered and to rise again from the dead? And Jesus began at Moses and all the prophets and preached unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And he shared to them what this resurrection would mean. I want you to understand here that when Jesus Christ rose again from the dead, that changes everything. Everything changes at that point. When Jesus Christ rose again from the dead, death is no longer victorious over anyone on this earth. It changes who I am. It changes what I believe. It changes my purpose in life. Everything changes based upon the fact that Jesus Christ is not in that tomb. It changes why I, lie, I live and why I breathe. Because the resurrection of Christ is the, important, the single most important event that's ever occurred on this earth. It changed poor fishermen into the greatest force on the earth. It says they turned the world upside down. And every one of those fishermen died for their belief. Every one of them died for their belief in Jesus Christ's resurrection. I don't think anyone would die for someone in a grave, someone who died. But the fact that they had seen him alive, that he had appeared to them, that he had showed them his hands and his, his side, showed them the hole in his side, they believed and they died for that. Now friends, we just go to this last point of this message is the hope of the resurrection. And again, we, I hope that you picked up the little Dahan tracks, I'm sorry, the Radio Bible Class tracks on 10 of their devotions on the hope of, of Easter. But the hope of the resurrection, there was a time in my life when I was dead in trespasses and sins. And I was afraid to, to, to sleep at night. I was afraid that I wouldn't wake up. I was afraid that I was going to die. I was very much afraid of death. And I was guilty all the time for the sins that I've committed. And I knew that I was a sinner and I didn't know how to get rid of that sin. My grandma would talk to me about it, would convict me, but it didn't help. My mom would have me watch Billy Graham, it didn't help. I was so convicted for my own sin. I knew I was a sinner, but I was without hope. Friends, the fact is that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The fact is the wages of sin is death. And I want to share with you right now that the message I'm going to preach to you right now is not my greatest message. It is God's greatest message. I'm not trying to preach to you a great message. What I'm trying to tell you is the greatest message that God has ever given us. That we are dead in trespasses and sins. There is no hope for us apart from Jesus Christ. The soul that sinneth, it must die. 
And the Old Testament was full of death. It was all about death. The Old Testament ends with the word curse. It's all about death. There is no hope up until the death of Jesus Christ. There is no hope. Without the resurrection, Jesus died because he was sin, yes. To remain in the tomb, yes, he's sin. Sin, the wages of sin is death. The soul that sinneth, it must die. And if we are sinners, we're going to die and spend an eternity in, in hell separated from God. There's no hope. The Bible says we were without God, without hope in the world, having no hope without God in the world. Without God, there is no hope. That's what we were. Ephesians 2.1, you have the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. We're already dead. You don't have to wait until you die. When, when, when we have sinned against God, He passes sentence against us immediate. The day that you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die, he said to Adam. The soul that sinneth, it must die. He passes sentence against us immediately. There's no time wait here that we're living until we die. We're dead now. And if we were to die in, in, in our sin the way we are now, we will spend an eternity in hell. Friends, when, when we were created, God breathed into the man the, the breath of life, and man became a living soul. That living soul is has the breath of God within him. He will either spend an eternity in heaven or an eternity in hell. He's not like an animal. We are not animals for one major reason, the fact that God breathed into the nostrils of man the breath of life. We did not evolve from an animal so that if we die, we return to the ground just like the animal does. We are a living soul, and our soul is either going to spend an eternity in hell or an eternity in heaven. That's what the Bible teaches we're different from animals. There is no hope apart from the fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross. In order to get to heaven, you must be 100% perfect, 100% pure. You must be as righteous as God is. The interesting problem there, you hear, years ago I used to see this, this ad for ivory snow. Ivory snow was 99 and 99 one hundred percent pure. I'm sorry, but if you're 99 and 99 one hundredths, you're not pure. You can be as many decimal points as you want to, point, 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 zero, one. I'm sorry, point zero, 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 one parts of sin within you, you're still a sinner. And I don't care how little your sin is in your sight, in God's sight, it's huge. And you will spend an eternity in hell because we're not pure. None of us are pure. But when Jesus Christ died upon the cross, he died for every single sin. That's what changes everything. But listen, if you take your Bible and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, please. If Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, you are yet in your sins. If there is no resurrection, then there's no justification. Give me a little bit of an illustration of that. I know this is off the subject. I know it'll embarrass my wife, but <laughs> I'm going to embarrass her. Um, years ago, I was so shy that I couldn't talk to people. I couldn't pray in front of people. I couldn't talk to two people at one time. And I was more shy than probably anybody in this room. I did not think very highly of who I was or what I had to say. I did not think very highly of the fact that I had four brothers, one sister, and... I didn't have a real good upbringing in my own, to myself, in my own life. Then I met my wife. And almost immediately, she believed in me. And she believed that I could do this, I could do that. She made me feel loved. And I'd never felt that way before. 
I'd never felt that way about anyone on this earth who loved me unconditionally. And when I met her, it changed everything in my life. I started feeling like, you know what? There's someone who actually believes in me. And then I began to understand that that's how God has been all along in my life. God created me for a purpose. He believes in me. He died upon the cross for my sin and he rose again. And that changed everything about humanity. It changed everything about my life. It changed everything about history. Then came Sunday. Here's some points that I want you to understand here about the resurrection. Number one, they would never die. The reason they would not die is because of the res resurrection. Jesus Christ said, I am the one who rose from the dead. That's not what he says. We're not talking about the resurrected one. We're talking about the resurrection. <laughs> Jesus is not just the resurrected one. He is the resurrection. The fact that he is alive means that I can be alive. The fact that he conquered death means that I can conquer death. They would not have to serve sin. Why? Because of the resurrection. Therefore, we're buried with him by baptism unto death. Like as Christ was raised up from the dead, we should walk in newness of life. I have hope in being able to conquer sin because of the resurrection. Then came Sunday. Sin was gone completely. It was paid for. Why? He was delivered for our offenses. He was raised for our justification. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is our justification. I understand the death of Christ paid for sin, but it was not justification until the resurrection. Aunt Matilda, <laughs> I will see Aunt Matilda. I don't think, I don't have an Aunt Matilda. That's just a name. But I don't have to worry about Aunt Matilda because Aunt Matilda's glorified. Aunt Matilda can sing, she can run, she can play, she can, she can dance. Aunt Matilda is glorified in heaven. It is sown in dishonor, it's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness, it's raised in power. That's what Aunt Matilda's like. My grandma and grandpa are like that. My aunts and uncles are like that. Those who have suffered will raise incorruptible sickness is not permanent. I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. I don't have to worry about suffering. Suffering, if there is no resurrection, is unjust. The cross of Jesus Christ is torture. Suffering is torture. Without the resurrection, we have nothing on this earth. But you heard about the gal from the Jewish Educational Center shooting this last week, and they interviewed her, and her husband died, and her son died. And you could not believe to look at her, the power in that gal. Because she says, I have family, and I have faith. And she had faith in the fact that there is a resurrection. It changes everything. Eternal life. Blessed be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who have given us a living, a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ to inheritance incorruptible, undeviled, fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Now having said that, there was no hope for you or for me, but then Jesus Christ, when he died upon the cross and he rose again from the dead, he took all of your sin upon himself and he paid for it. If you let me use this for an illustration real quickly, this hand represents you and I. All of us have sin. This represents sin. Every single person on this earth has sin. This wallet is our sin. It is upon us. God is perfect. There is no sin. He loves us. He hates our sin because that sin separates us from God. He created us to have fellowship, but we, because of sin, we cannot have fellowship with God. And the soul that sinneth, it must die. We are going to die and spend an eternity in hell because we have sin on us. And of course, re religion says just get rid of some of that sin. <laughs> you can try to get rid of some of your sin. You still have sin on you. But the Bible says, For he, God, hath made him Christ to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. 
I said you had to be pure, not 99 and 99, 100% pure. You have to be pure. When Jesus Christ took that sin, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. How righteous is God? If you have God's righteousness, how righteous are you? If you have God's righteousness, you have what is needed by God to have eternal life and to have eternal life in heaven for eternity. And that's what Jesus Christ did. And then this is the last point about hope, but there's a lot of things about the resurrection. It changes everything. He is able to save them to the uttermost that come to God by him. He ever lives to make intercession. He ever lives to make intercession. As I said to you before, when I met my wife, it's not a feeling, it's a person. And she changed my life on this earth. But Jesus Christ is a living person. He changed everything on this earth. He changed everything when it comes to my soul. He changed everything because he not only died on the cross, but when he rose from the dead, he's still alive. If he would die on the cross for my sins, what is he going to do for me now that he's alive? He is able to save them to the uttermost. He makes intercession for me. If when we were enemies we were reconciled, much more being reconciled would be saved by his life. And again, blessed be God who hath given us a living hope, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That hope's alive. It's a living hope. And I want you to understand this again as we close here today. We just... The resurrection is about having hope. It is about eternal life, but eternal life is not just quantity. Oh yes, I'm going to go to heaven for eternity. Eternal life is about quality. Because when you have Christ, you have Christ's life. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, He is our life. Whatever happens to Him happens to us. Because that Jesus Christ is God Himself, Whatever happens to God, whatever happens to Christ, Christ is our life. He is the resurrection. He is the life. He that liveth and believeth in him shall never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe that? I am so thankful for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that he is no longer in the grave, that you can come before him and you can understand that he's living and he makes intercession for you, that you have a person that you can come to all the time. I'd like to have you close your eyes and bow your head, please. I want to just ask you, if you're living in the death of Christ, are you living in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Living in the death of Christ is all about Jesus dying on the cross for your sins. And that's a wonderful thing. But that death means very little to you if you're not living in the resurrection of Jesus Christ if you don't understand that he rose again from the dead for your sins and he's giving you a living hope hope that will never perish that will never end because it's a person he is your life he doesn't just give you life he is your life if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as Savior you can have eternal life today you can know that your sins are forgiven would like to encourage you to make that decision right now by just simple a simple prayer of asking Christ to save you by saying Lord I know I'm a sinner I know you died on the cross for me the best I know how I want to put my trust in you as the one who died for me I'm asking you to save me right now and he promises to do that I want to thank you for tuning into our program it's been a delight to have you I trust that you understand a little bit more about what Jesus Christ did for you when he died on the cross. Salvation is not something that you receive because you're born into a family or because you go to church or because you're good. Salvation is a free gift, but that gift has to be received. If you have not received it, we'd like to have you take some time to talk to God and ask him that he might be your savior. You understand that you are a sinner, that Jesus Christ died for you, that you can know that you have eternal life by putting your trust in Christ today.